You're listening to The Valley Current. Hello again, sir. Hey, Joe. How have you been? Great, thank you. How are you? Pretty good. You're looking great. Tell me about your journey because you were born overseas, right? Correct. I was an Air Force brat. I was actually born in Panama um, in a town called Ancon, Panama. And I wasn't born on the Air Force base, but I was born of American parents. But in the 60s, what that meant was I had to be a naturalized American citizen. I wasn't an automatic American citizen. Right. Um, means I can't run for president. So there go my plans for world domination. Wow. Okay. Well, does that mean you can possibly be vice president? Probably not that either, right? I don't know what the rules are anymore, but I kind of feel like most of the people in charge don't know what the rules are anymore. So my right. my guess is anything is possible until it isn't. So where, where do you go to school? Where did you go to school? So I, being born in Panama, we stayed there until I was five. Um, and we moved to Mississippi, which is where my parents met. And uh, I grew up in Mississippi from age five to 16. Um, and I... I graduated from high school at 16. And when most people hear that, they think, oh, you must have been brilliant. And my response is, no, I was very clever. Um, I, I saw that you could make up for a failed class by taking summer school. So I reasoned that if you could make up for a failed class, you could jump ahead. And that's what I did. And so that's how I ended up uh, graduating at 16. I was wholly unprepared to go to college. So I ended up going, um, I, I became an exchange student and ended up in Sweden. And I landed in Sweden. I was there for about a year and a half. Magical time, amazing. Um, I returned to Mississippi, a, a practical polyglot at that point, and uh, went to a, a small college called Millsaps College in Jackson. Most people don't know Millsaps, but they know the cohort it's in. They know Vanderbilt, Tulane, Rice, all the universities that Millsaps competes with. Okay. So I was there until my junior year, and I wanted to go back abroad again. So my school didn't have an abroad program, so I created my own, and I ended up going to Paris for a year. Wow. So this is quite an, an education. I mean, you you have become, in my eyes, kind of the expert in what's either called legal tech or law tech. And you gave a great presentation uh, yeah. to a group of mediators. And I was one of them in the audience. And in fact, I was on the panel and I'm in fact leading the panel. And I thought, you know, I have to have you on the podcast because you just know everything about this area that's accelerating so rapidly. So tell me how you made that journey because you ended up in Los Angeles, right? Yeah, I, I was a, you know, when I came back to Mississippi after um, Paris, I finished my degree and I um, ended up. So at the time, there were these things called libraries. That right, were, with books, with books and copy machines. Exactly. <laughs> Mimeograph machines, believe it or not. Um, and I I, uh, I went to the library because, you know, I'd been to Europe. I spoke a couple of languages. I wanted to go back to Europe. And I found a reference book called The Directory of American Firms with Overseas Operations. And I wrote 160 resumes and cover letters to uh, places all over the country, like Boston, uh, Phoenix, Los Angeles. And it ended up that the preponderance of these places were in New York City. And I got one positive response out of all those resumes and cover letters from an agency in New York that invited me to audition for an internship program. And I thought, audition? What? What are you talking about? Yeah. Internship? I don't want an internship. I want a job. Right, right. My mother arm twisted me into continuing that process. And lo and behold, in you know the late 80s, I landed in New York City as an intern in this agency and they had the gold standard training program so i started the training program there and i ended up for the next roughly 30 years living in manhattan working for 15 of those years in new york city agencies so i worked right. across a variety of clients um and then i was recruited by the swatch group as the uh, chief marketing officer for the u.s subsidiary and then uh, that was that's the world's largest watch company 160 right member companies, 22 watch brands. It's a big conglomerate. Right. And so mine was the first role like that in the 24 subsidiaries that they had. And uh, I ended up spending time in the UK, in Switzerland, and in China. Um, and then when I came back to the United States, I uh, opened up my own consulting company called Left of Center Consulting. And it's sort of like my brand of unconventional strategy. And I was able to apply it to a broad array of clients. So they were consumer goods, luxury brands, services, you name it. 
And uh, in 2018, or 2017, 2018, I moved to LA. Mm -hmm. I joined an entrepreneurs group and uh, there was a, an attorney in the group who ran his own business. It wasn't, uh, he consulted to law firms. He was no mm -hmm. longer in the law firm. And he said to me, I've never met a law firm that didn't consider itself a luxury brand. And he wanted help with his brand. So I attended a few uh, conferences with him and that opened the doorway to me working in legal tech with CRM systems, SaaS platforms, all kinds of legal tech offerings. That was just like five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. What's interesting to me is that my background is like, if it's glitter and unicorns, it's just Tuesday, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's Procter & Gamble and Unilever and Volvo and Six Flags and, you know, Dr. Soaps, all of these consumer brands and like, you know, no, no real B2B. But what I found that was that legal creative was a desert mm. and it was starving for what I thought was my secret sauce, which is that that ability to marry creativity and relevance. I've been able to create quite a successful uh, opportunity out of that for myself. And that's that's kind of where that began. And then growing up in agency life, Jack, mm -hmm. you have to know everything about your client. And by everything, I mean everything. And that training for a decade and a half plus taught me that if I'm going to work in a category, I need to be deeply steeped in the category. So what you saw of me standing up and you know presenting to a room full of mediators on international mediation and legal technology was the sum total of about two years worth of learning everything, knowing everything, understanding everything. That's training. Well, that two years is quite invaluable because um when you think about the technology curve it's accelerating so rapidly i mean lawyers didn't really use crm systems just a few years ago they would keep like index cards and notes and there are still managing partners who bring in the girl to print out their email that they redline and hand back to the girl to go and respond. Right. The fax machines are still fairly new in the legal industry. So, yes, legal technology is a little bit like jumbo shrimp. It sounds like an oxymoron. Right. Uh, but the, the truth is there, there was a, a Bloomberg Law report that was released last January that showed that lawyers are using more technology than they ever have, but they understand it less than they ever did. I think that's true. I think that many lawyers want to believe that this is not the future and that we can go back to the old ways of doing business. But then again, there's a whole new crop of lawyers and platform law firms that are really networks of different sub firms that are embracing totally this idea that technology is, is here to stay. And maybe we're going to see a complete uh, remaking of the legal system in a similar way to some degree that you could argue medicine and even dentistry is being remade where there's so much equipment and so much software and so much, uh, so many different technology tools that to the older lawyer, and there's still a large number of lawyers that are still practicing over the age of 60. It's not like London in the UK where they get to about 50 or 55 and they're like, thank you very much. It's been a great career. That may be changing too, but in the US, lawyers are staying with it sometimes right into the 50th year of their practice. So 50 years of practice. Can you imagine going back 50 years to imagine what that was like? Because it was a completely different time. I'll drop another footnote because we just saw this movie from the 1920s about this uh, Indian tribe. It's it's a famous movie about the Osage Indians uh, being being played up as a somewhat documentary. And it shows all this innovation that happened in the early 1900s, the automobile, the airplane, the telephone. And it really does bring to light, like we're going through another big cycle here where more and more technology is absorbing what would otherwise be, you know, horse-drawn carriages, right? Definitely. And I, I think I think you're right about um, legal kind of pushing back on technology for for some very good reasons and for some reasons that are just like the ones you cited what we have noticed is that there is that generational divide so there are managing partners in their 60s and forward but the new incoming lawyers are gen z 
So, you know, the managing partners cut their teeth learning how to write contracts by sitting in a room filled with dozens of boxes of contracts, and they read through them and understood them. For Gen Z, there's an app for that. Right. right? The question is, is it any less valid because of technology? And are, there are some areas like, you know, this this very deep exploration into artificial intelligence and its application in the legal arena that needs to be slow rolled but other things like crm systems and that, that other businesses use to great avail probably need to be adopted more rapidly ai i'm on the fence about in a lot of ways i think that it can help with a lot of areas but i don't think that it replaces areas i mean mediators get very concerned that somehow people are going to turn to ai to make a recommended settlement and they just think that's like an impossible task certainly in complex cases it's hard to imagine how you would even instruct a computer to do any sort of automated thinking around what's the potential solution but we also didn't believe a while ago that AI could pass a bar exam, yet it appears AI can pass a bar exam. And today I saw the a report that it passed the ethics exam. And you have to shake your head when you say, well, that's not possible because we also didn't think that any sort of AI tool would be able to beat a chess master. And yet sure. that happened a while ago and the Jeopardy uh, champion got beat as well. So. It's hard to sort of imagine a future that doesn't have continuous innovation because we've seen that over the last hundred years, right? I, I couldn't agree more. We we will have continuous innovation, but I think that there is, how many people do you know pass the bar exam but didn't go on to become a lawyer, right? So passing the bar is one element practicing law in a practical way. You and I both know that we learn things out of books in university that are perfect world scenarios. Once you get in the chair and start doing the work, you realize the perfect world doesn't exist. I mean, Plato said, we cannot achieve the ideal because we live in the real, right? right? And books teach us an ideal. AI passing the bar is an ideal, but would an AI be able to negotiate a settlement between multiple parties in a mediation? I penned an article for Bloomberg over the summer where I said, no, you, AI can maybe help a mediator understand the issues around a case faster, better, whatnot, but it lacks the ability to understand the nuance between individuals, that human element that is uniquely human and can't be really replicated. Now, right. here I am sitting here saying this and you know, what you just said is that the speed of innovation is coming. Maybe I'll be proven wrong in five minutes or five years. Who knows? But as we sit here today, I I would almost trust an AI to settle a mediation. I'm in less than I would being able to talk to a person. Listen, sonic showers are more effective than water-based showers. What kind of shower do you take? Water-based, right? like everybody else except for people orbiting the earth in a space station right, right. <laughs> um but that they, they're more effective why don't we use them right uh, you know we just don't so yes ai may be able to practice law but do you really want an ai lawyer do you want an ai neurosurgeon because i don't no i mean i think i think people do have levels of distrust that there are some people that are starting to gain a little more trust i know there are creative types and I'm interested in getting your input on this, who believe that ChatGBT and BARD and all these other various flavors that are coming out from the different competitors, they can actually augment creativity for marketing and other pursuits that are mainly human by visualizing things much more rapidly, sort of the way in which you could argue the internet can be used to just scan images to sort of brainstorm and it gives you a brainstorming tool. I don't know if you think there's some truth to that in the field, because your field is marketing, right? Your your major profession. Yes. yes, it is. It is marketing, and uh, and I am a, a big devotee for creativity. Um, I think that there is a distinct difference between augment and enhance versus replace. Mm -hmm. So. I'll give you an example. Uh, my next door neighbor is a director and he's a, he's a writer director and he um, was a 
co-writer and directed the Goosebumps series that uh, was on Disney recently. It debuted mm-hmm. October 31st. I asked him if there was going to be a second season, and he said, we won't know until the algorithm tells us. I'm like, wow. Me. The studio doesn't make those decisions. They wait for like two weeks after it's out, and the algorithm is what they trust. They, the algorithm makes that decision. And I thought to myself, this is what we've come to, where a creative decision is left in the hands of a mathematical equation. Now, the very famous Coca-Cola ad from the 70s, I'd like to buy the world a Coke, you know, that song was not supposed to see the light of day. The people at Coke hated it. The agency loved it. They ran it anyway, and it became an icon. Apple's 1984 ad on the Super Bowl, which gave birth to the Super Bowl being a forum to show ads, right, and to market products, they voted against it. They didn't want it. They didn't want to do it. Like, it was basically vetoed. And 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 Jobs and Wozniak had to put up the money themselves, right? Didn't that be part of the story? There you go. And they sold $110 million worth of Macintoshes off the back of that ad. I think they placed $40,000. I think that's what it cost. It was some obscenely low amount of money. But my, my point is, if you always trusted the algorithm, mm-hmm. you would have these beautiful, uh, you know, paradigm shifting opportunities right. um, you can point to today. And so I'm really an advocate for creativity. And I feel like we're, well, I know this, the World Economic Forum recently released its future of jobs report. Mm-hmm. And Number two, most desirable skill in a survey of 13,000 executives globally was creative thinking. Right. Marry that with Harvard Harvard Business Review, who uh, recently released a a study that said only 8% of CEOs in America think their chief marketing officer has the creative capacity to do the job. Wow. That means that the head of marketing lacks creative capacity. And creative thinking is the number two most desired skill in the world. They didn't say that the ability to manage an AI to be creative for you. They're talking about human creativity. So when you say, can an AI augment and enhance? I think that's brilliant. That's great. You know, and a lot of graphic artists will probably morph over into being, you know, to using the tools and AI will become a tool for that. But I don't think that it's a replacement. Right. It's not going to take the big risk that Jobs and Wozniak took on that 1984 ad. It's not going to take the big risk that whoever was the person, I think the Mad Men series suggested was a Madison Avenue firm, maybe Chiat Day, who came up with that Coca-Cola ad. And, you know, those are big risks. And you could argue AI is probably biased in favor of small, incremental, tiny, tiny things as opposed to let's send the person to the moon and now let's send the person to Mars and maybe let's send the person to, you know, the outer reaches of the galaxy. Those are big, 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 big leaps. And AI is not going to take that kind of conjecture anywhere. And they're not even going to come up with that conjecture because it's got to be a completely out of the box thought, but maybe it can spur humans and some directions and maybe in the mediation context, it can spur some creative thinking in the room that can somehow change the dynamic and get to creating the rapport that's necessary because obviously relationships that get created between the mediator and the litigants and the lawyers are pretty critical. And I think that part is probably irreplaceable. You can't get a computer to ever do that, right? It's hard to it's hard to sort of build trust like that. And um, one of our our mediator colleagues who was at that summit, um, Orit Asnan, she told me a beautiful story about a long protracted mediation between um, two co heads of a of a company that basically just had very different um, operating mentalities about the company, and so they needed to split the company, and they would still it was still being very successful. But after years of mediation, they came down to one last item. And the amount of money associated with the item was actually fairly small in the overall scheme of the money's moving back and forth. Right. But neither party would budge. They just would not budge. This was the this was their Rubicon, right? And she had an absolutely brilliant brainstorm. She said, why don't we turn this into a charitable contribution? Right. 
You give 50% of the money on the table to side B's charity choice. Side B, you give 50% to side A's choice of a charity. And you know that in a heartbeat, it was settled. They, they both agreed on the spot instantly right. because it was non-threatening. It was, it was a beautiful, you know, culmination to all of this work. But that one, the one thing they were immovable on, I don't know that a computer could have come up with the idea of a charitable donation that was like cross-referenced that way as an, as an, a viable alternative and outcome. I think that's brilliant. Right. We, we at the foundation, you know, the nonprofit that I helped get started called the foundation for creativity and dispute resolution. We've been promoting these ideas for a while about using charities as the way to bridge these small differences that ultimately become you know, which way, you know, which way can you break an egg, small side, big side, people are fighting over tiny things and nothing's happening. And the truth is most mediators are not trained in the direction to bring in third parties. They think third parties are going to violate confidentiality, privacy. They don't think that way. They think more like zealous advocates as opposed to, hey, how can we create one in one equals three or greater? So I think whatever tools that are out there that can enhance that thinking, and maybe that there are no tools and maybe just training. And we at the foundation have found that many mediators aren't really trained in creativity and in creative thinking. They just don't think that way because they go to law school, they become lawyers and they think as zealous advocates do. So it's a big, it's a big problem. And people who offer those solutions, and she is a great mediator, so she offered a great solution, can really bring a lot of value to the table. And it is kind of a form of marketing in a way a mediator has to do some marketing of ideas that seem foreign, right? These are like foreign ideas, but once you have the rapport and the connection to the people, they obviously trusted her and they viewed her as being very objective. And that's where there's a tremendous value add. It's clear. Yes, I agree more. Absolutely. So you've been involved recently in startups, including in the, I forget if you call it law tech or legal tech. Some people think they're awesome. distinct. They're all the same, right? I mean, some people think, well, one is more like associated with platforms and another one is more associated with research. Right. It's like splitting hairs, but there's clearly a lot of platforms there's clearly platforms that are trying to organize mediators in better ways. There's this notion out there of building an ecosystem that sort of breaks down the associations that the need for like dispute resolution houses so that it could actually be a, a, a marketplace. And you can find if, if your particular um, grievance that you want to enter into mediation or you're bound to enter into mediation about happens to be uh, about shipping when both two foreign ships in a foreign port, right? right. So a Korean ship, a Swedish ship in a, in a UK port, you probably want someone who has maritime litigation experience or understands the, the nuances and the jargon and that sort of thing. And the notion of the marketplace is that you can actually go and find that person very easily through some kind of directory where they're all listed with their skills and their bona fides and that sort of thing. Um, and then you, there have, there will probably end up being ways that you can um, do the conflicts checks and things like that that'll be automated. But I feel like those that kind of concept is probably coming because we've already proven that you can do it hybrid and we can you can do it purely virtual. That's that's already known and done. And there are people even in our cohort in uh, at our conference who are very opposed to doing it that way. They really want the face to face, and I get that. But there are companies where the C-suite says pulling me out of my seat for a week to do a mediation in another city and I'm eight hours a day, I'm going to be away from my phone and my computer, et cetera, is a non-starter. I've got right. a business. Like if I can dip in and dip out when I'm needed, I would prefer to do that virtually because the cost to the business for me being out of my chair is actually greater than the cost under dispute. Right, right. I think that battle is going to go on for a while until there's some white papers or something that say, look, the percentages are, are comparable or they're becoming comparable and you don't need to actually do the in-person FaceTime. 
Now, there's some people that believe you, you need to do it. And I have, I know other people who believe, well, lots of mediations start and then actually finish on Zoom or Teams or some other virtual media because the start is like the initial building of rapport and then the follow-up can all happen in a different way. So we may see a hybrid model play out there. I mean, I don't know what you're seeing in the startup world because you've had your 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 last few years doing startups, but the startups all want to be virtual, right? They all want to do this stuff on a platform like basis, don't they? They are creating platforms to do it on. And there's there's a, a term uh, from a few years ago called the platformization of the legal industry because everyone was selling. It was no longer SaaS. It was PaaS. It was platform as a service. Right. Um, and and that's, that's a very interesting uh, sort of way to look at it. But in, in my view, all of the technical tools are tools, right? They're there. The technologies are tools to support the business of law, this of law and the business of law, which are two different things. One is more back office. One is more sort of client facing. When it comes to sort of the startup life, the, 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 the lifeblood of the startup is innovation. Like that's really what it's all about. Um, and startups mean innovation. Their, their capacity is much larger than the sort of big sclerotic organizations. Uh, they just can't, they don't, or they don't want to innovate. It's, to, it's easier for them to acquire than to develop. Some of them once in a while will have a department somewhere off to the side that's a skunk works. It never really goes anywhere, but they love to say they have it. And it really does please the people who are in it because they love to tinker and they're kind of paid to be in-house entrepreneurs and sort of uh, technologists as it were. But what I'm finding is that, you know, innovation is such a driver for companies, for startups, that they're driven to get it to a point and then maybe the exit they're looking for is to sell it to one of those larger organizations. Or they want to build such a better mousetrap that people just beat a path to their door and it just grows and becomes its own thing. But for every 100 funded startups in legal tech, only one survives. Right. So yet... Funding is funded startups are happening every day. So what that tells us is hope springs eternal because innovation never ends to your point. Right. I mean, people want to believe that they can become the next Airbnb, the next Uber. I mean, this dual sided approach where you're really in the middle between the supply and the demand and you're providing something that's like a market and a marketing system baked in to the market. I mean, owning that obviously is a huge advantage. Uber has a huge advantage. I mean, they've been chased for a while by Lyft. Uh, Airbnb has a huge advantage. I don't know who, I guess VRBO and a few others are out there that have chased them or maybe even existed before them. But they clearly have a huge advantage because once they aggregate enough players on both sides of that dual-sided market, it's hard to break that. Now it can be broken. There's no question that, you know, platforms come into Vogue and then go out of Vogue. We've seen it before. Facebook took over a market that arguably was in the hands of another platform. I mean, these things can change. And I suppose with different generations, they might change. There are people like my kids are saying, we don't use Facebook anymore, dad. We use Instagram now. Now it's a Facebook product but it really is a different platform. And Facebook is almost viewed as old and fuddy, fuddy duddy in comparison. So you have to wonder where this is all gonna go on the legal tech side, because I know there's resistance among lawyers, but then again, there's also these breakthroughs. Like today, there was a major announcement by a major recruiter saying that they're gonna provide a platform where you can basically as a law firm order up a gig worker and they're going to be the platform provider. And I guess they get leads for different firms that actually want talent and maybe will buy permanent placement. But the fact that there's a platform there is sort of suggesting you don't need to call us to actually tell us specifically what you want in an associate and you an associate don't need to call us to tell you, tell us what you're looking for in the matching service that those uh, headhunters provide. 
So that's a big change in the legal field because people didn't think that you can do that. But now they're, it's, a, it's the same sort of matching idea that we talked about a minute ago in the mediation space where you can sort of order up some specifics and something to come out of it. So what have you learned? What have you learned as a, as a result of sort of this last few years of being in legal tech, law tech, and, and startup world? What would you say you've learned from all that? That relationships are critical for success. They're fundamental. Um, they require work and nurturing. It's not like you glad hand somebody once at a conference and you can call them five years later or five months later for funding advice or something like that. It, in my mind, to, to have a relationship, to be in a relationship with someone or some entity means to be of service to. It doesn't mean I'm there with my hand out to get something. It means I'm there with my hand out to serve something, to offer something. It, it, yes, it can be reciprocal, and it, in many ways it should be, but they don't need to be transactional, right? And I think that's where people get confused. That's not a relationship. Um, that's just sort of a one-way street. But to me, relationships are richest when you approach them with the abundance mindset versus the scarcity mindset because it's about how everybody can win together versus if i win it necessarily means you must lose right scarcity mindset so in in my view being in the startup world the last few years what i've noticed is the beautiful support that these startups give one another because they're really you know you don't want to be the only startup in a category because then you're a lone wolf but you right. also don't need the 11th in there either. You know what I mean? Like there is kind of a, a magic number that legitimizes the approach because then ultimately there will be a shakeout. And I, you know, I, I love the startup world for its innovation, for its energy. Um, I understand why the big companies kind of let those companies do all the hard yards and then kind of come in with a big pocketbook. Wish they had the funding of the big companies and the big companies wish they had the energy of the startup. Right. Yeah, that's true. So you're doing your own marketing firm right now, right? Is that what you're doing? For the last 12 years, I've run left of center consulting and the, I hire out as a fractional CMO. And so a large, a large number of these organizations, like, like a mediation where we met, um, right. like, uh, like one place at NTAP and various and, uh, other legal tech companies I've served in some kind of capacity, like a fractional CMO or been the actual fractional CMO. Okay. Um, and, you know, the, the situation there is that a, a chief marketing officer is expensive. Yeah. Um, and, there, the question for a startup is, you know, the, the first question is how much does it cost? And the answer is why buy the cow when you can get the milk at a reasonable price? Right, right. So tell people how they can reach you because our audience has many startups and many startups really need you. And you're a very creative guy and right. very fast at doing the stuff that you need to get done. I mean, you, you're, you're, you're very capable. So how, how would they reach you? Well, I appreciate that. Um, the best way to reach me is to find me on LinkedIn at Joseph Panetta on LinkedIn. And also my company is, uh, the website is LOCC.me. So it's left of center consulting, LOCC.me. Right. So that's the best way just to do it, to get to the website and then all the contact information yeah. is there. And same with LinkedIn. If you want to know anything, the majority of the content that I've published and the stuff that I've done for all of my legal tech clients, you'll find it on my LinkedIn page. You'll see all of the, the articles, the videos and things like that. It'll give you a good flavor for the, what unconventional thinking can bring you. Right. Well, thank you, Joseph, for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. We'll look forward to staying in touch. And I will send you other stuff that I think might be worthy of a further topic in the future because your expertise is deep and you're a very capable guy and I'm sure there'll be some startups that we do work with that we'll refer to you. Well, from your mouth to God's ears, thank you very much. This was a pleasure. It's always good to talk to you. Let's be in touch soon. Of course. See you, Joseph. Bye-bye. Tune in next time on The Valley Current.